This next panel, which it's a real honor to introduce to you, um, ties in directly with Jeff's comments about the siloed approach to different initiatives, creating collisions by crossing sector lines. And I can also attest, I've had the honor of traveling on 15 different trade missions with our governor, lieutenant governor, and mayor over the last 10 to 15 years. And it is shocking and amazing to me how little dialogue there is amongst the leaders of, of various companies. And so this cross-sectional dialogue is incredibly important, and so this panel is incredibly timely. Agriculture is undeniably in a state of innovation. Throughout Indiana, food and agricultural businesses are developing new and creative technologies. But what is even more exciting is the potential for game-changing research and discovery when these ideas converge or collide across various industries. Consider the collaboration and the efficiency that we enjoy right now in Indiana from groups like Agrinovus, TechPoint, BioCrossroads, and Conexus. We have created a new Biosciences Research Institute. An IoT lab will be opening in Fishers, and a 16 tech innovation district is being created as we speak. Ag Biosciences finds itself in the center of all of these initiatives. It is a sector that is already connected to what may seem like completely disconnected industries from life sciences to advanced manufacturing to tech. As a result, it is very exciting to introduce to you the next four distinguished executives for a discussion around ag biosciences. These are thought leaders and visionaries of Indiana. As a result, the businesses they lead and have led are national and global success stories. And it's my pleasure to introduce the one person who can best guide this discussion, a good personal friend of mine, a fellow North Central High School graduate, and the host of Inside Indiana Business, Gary Dick. Melissa, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as we begin, I'll just have the pan panelists, you want to come on up and uh, make your way to the stage and be seated. And while you do that, I'll uh, take care of a few housekeeping uh, items. Um, number one, for tweeters, <coughs> tweeters out there, we uh, are taking questions uh, and your tweets to uh, hashtag AgSummit17 uh, will show up on the screen and we can get questions here asked of our panelists. And uh, we'll also be taking questions from the audience as well. I believe we have microphones on either side uh, of the room as well for live questions uh, as we get into the uh, discussion. I want to begin, <clears throat> first of all, what great comments by Jeff Simmons. I mean, you talk about courageous leadership and tremendous leadership, not only for Elanco, but for the state of Indiana and our country. Uh, Jeff is, is certainly right there and very important for this uh, initiative to be sure. Uh, to uh, Beth and everyone at Agrinovus, again, congratulations. I remember very well a few years ago when this all started, thinking about the potential and what it could mean, not just for central Indiana, but the entire state with the assets that are here. And uh, congratulations uh, for this summit and all the, the work that you and your team have done to put this together. The topic of courageous leadership, and Jeff really uh, laid it out, I thought, uh, very well, I think is really important for the state of Indiana. For our discussion today, but I think for communities all over the state, leadership and how rural communities engage in the economy and so many levels, leadership uh, is important. Uh, no matter the sector of the economy, uh, extremely important. And uh, you think about the power of convergence, of the collision of innovation and leadership. What can happen uh, when those things uh, take place, when people and companies and communities collaborate across industry sectors and geographic boundaries to make things happen? Indiana's a national leader. I think, as we all know, legitimately a national leader uh, in ag and the ag biosciences, the life sciences, advanced manufacturing, IT. Indianapolis alone, I think, is growing IT jobs at something like three uh, times the national average. So the tech momentum uh, is very real. But what are the possibilities uh, of uh, collaboration to create greater innovation, investment, jobs, and wealth for our state? These are some of the uh, things we'll be talking about with a tremendous panel uh, who has joined us here. I'm going to give some brief introductions, and we'll get right to the uh, discussion. On my immediate left uh, is Mr. Uh, John McDonald. John is uh, the CEO of a company that uh, 
is doing some great things. Clear Object, it's based in Fishers. It uh, has been recognized by Inc. Magazine as the fastest uh, growing IT services company in Indiana in 2014, 15, 16, and 17. So there's some consistency with John's uh, company. He's formerly a uh, tech sales executive at IBM for more than 20 years, really a leader on multiple levels of Indiana's tech movement, including leadership, uh, a, a big leadership role in the formation of the IoT lab that we'll be hearing about uh, in Fishers. Uh, next to uh, John, we have Victor Mancinelli. Vic is chairman and CEO of CTB International Corporation. And that is based in Milford, uh, Indiana, northern Indiana. It is a Berkshire Hathaway company. CTB is a leading global designer, manufacturer, and marketer of systems and solutions for producing uh, grain, poultry, pigs, and eggs, and for processing poultry as well. Founded in 1952, the company operates from multiple locations around the world with a billion dollars in annual sales. And Vic, thank you for being here. Next to Vic, uh, we have uh, Rajan Gajaria. He's Vice President of Crop Protection, the business platform at uh, Dow, uh, I have to uh, become current, uh, Dow DuPont. Uh, and it's great to have Rajan with us today. He, uh, in his role, he is responsible for shaping the business strategy, defining capital and uh, R&D investment priorities, also overseeing supply chain. Most recently, he was uh, Vice President of Latin America and North America for Dow AgriSciences. His career spans several decades, continents, and uh, functions as he helped build the business and uh, advocate for modern ag. Rajan, thank you. And last but certainly not least, Mr. John Lechleiter, the Chairman Emeritus of the Board of Eli Lilly and Company. John retired as Lilly's President and CEO uh, about a year ago, December 31 of 2016, after 37 years with the company, also served as Chairman of the Board at Lilly through May of this year. John joined Lilly in 1979 as a senior organic chemist, rising through the ranks to lead the company, uh, in, importantly to lead the company through really perhaps its most difficult time uh, ever. And John, thank you for being here as well. And since I introduced you last, John, I'll go to you first um, with, a, with the first question. I remember distinctly, I think it was at a Bio Crossroads Summit, perhaps, where you talked about this issue uh, of Indiana having the, these tremendous assets and the need for collaboration uh, and partnership in, in, in crossing across um, real or imagined lines. Talk about where you see things now in 20, almost 2018 uh, in terms of kind of the, uh, the state of the economy when it comes to the ag biosciences and the possibilities. Well, I think the, the, the state of the economy is strong in, in many ways. I think the possibilities, though, are even, even greater. I mean, I, I think we have to start with, as we would at any place, uh, as our earlier speaker described, with what we're good at. Where are our strengths? And agriculture has historically been a strength. Manufacturing has been a strength. Uh, the biosciences, medical products industry uh, today, a great strength. Uh, logistics and, and transportation, supply chain, these are things that are all being talked about separately. I think the challenge, Gary, is how do we put all of these together to make the whole greater than the sum of the parts. And I think what we've learned uh, as the IBRI came together, Reiner's here with us today, is that it, it, it takes leadership, that, like Jeff talked about, and it takes courage for each of us to step out of our silos and say, look, we've got to work together for the good of the, for the, good of the whole. Uh, and I know we collaborate in many ways, but I think there's great opportunity for us to do more. And I think it's got to not just be between businesses, we've got to bring in our great universities in the state into the process. We have to get state and local government invested uh, in this effort as, as well. But I'm, I, like so many speakers say, I'm an optimist. I, I think the cup is, is half full, not half empty, but I think there's still work ahead of us to do. Yeah, well, we'll get to some specifics uh, there as we go through the conversation. Rajan, as you look at things from an ag bioscience, a plant sciences standpoint, your thoughts? Well, the first thing I would like to say is uh, proud to be a Hoosier. I think I've got to start saying that. Uh, so that people know that this is a really a welcoming community. My family and I have been here for 20 years, and it's been a fantastic thing. We are testaments of Hoosier hospitality, so I do want to start by saying that. Uh, that really leads to the first thing I want to talk about, which is globalization. There is a tendency right now to start thinking along only boundaries of what countries are. But uh, agriculture truly is a global supply chain. There is a part of the world where there is the demand which is growing. Uh, let's talk about it as Asia. 
And there is a part of the world which is the supply chain from a supply end standpoint, which is the Americas. So whether it is Brazil, Argentina, US, Canada. If you are in Europe, yeah, your Germany has a lot of the demand, but it really comes from Netherlands. So the global aspects of agriculture are here to be seen. The second part of it is, we have spoken a bit about it, is the confluence of innovation. From an ag standpoint, when we look at this in Dow DuPont, very simply put, you really need to bring physics, chemistry, and biology, everything together to solve a problem which a farmer has. If you take it one level up, whether it's biotechnology, crop protection, big data, drone technology, nanotechnology, self-driven vehicles, all these things are getting to a point where unless we have the humility, and that to me is one of the key things from a leadership trait standpoint is humility. Unless we all have the humility to learn from each other and collaborate, we are not going to bring the confluence of technologies to really take this to the next step. And the last piece of the puzzle, I think um, Jeff alluded to this before, is uh, consumer acceptance. My eldest daughter just graduated from the Kelly School of Business at IU, and she works for General Mills, a company that proudly says that this contains no GMO. I have to remind her that the money which paid her fees came from trying to teach the world <laughs> that GMOs are a good thing. So uh, I think this is the <coughs> challenge. Uh, the reason I brought that up is because mm. if I cannot constructively influence my kids at home, which has got a challenge, we obviously have a long way to go in terms of how we can influence consumers. But next time any of you see somebody wanting to buy GMO-free water, please tell them that such a thing does not exist. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Vic, the view from a, a CTB, especially when it comes to ag tech and, uh, and IoT, the Internet of Things, which I know Indiana has a great opportunity in. Yeah, thank you, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here, by, by the way. Our company is out of Milford, Indiana, which is a small town of about 3,000 people and the same amount of cows in that general <laughs> area. So. When we get a chance to come down to Indy, the big city, we're more than glad to do so. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, our company is in equipment uh, and uh, machinery and systems to help uh, poultry farmers and pig farmers and grain farmers to become more productive. Uh, our mission and uh, also uh, our vision is in three words, leadership through innovation. So to us, developing new products is critical. And working uh, with universities also is critical uh, for the kind of products that, that we try to develop. Having Purdue in our backyard is a, uh, is a huge uh, resource advantage. And I say that having graduated from IU, by the way, and it's not easy to admit that, but we have to. Uh, so a lot of the products that we produce, we collaborate very, uh, in many ways, with many universities, both in U.S. and in, in Europe, uh, because that's where a lot of the innovation is, is coming from. Some of them we fund, others are funded by others, and we try to collaborate within that framework. When we look at uh, protein, I really enjoyed Jeff's uh, presentation, by the way. We, uh, I thought that was really thought-provoking. What we fight more than anything else right now is science versus people's belief, emotions, if you will. It's a very difficult battle to have because eventually emotions always wins out. And we in the industry tends to, to want to communicate on a scientific basis. And unfortunately, many consumers just don't want to hear about it anymore. So, in some ways, uh, we acquiesce to that and provide products uh, and systems that tends to promote what consumers want at the time, but still maintaining the science within the, uh, those products. But that's going to remain a challenge and it's going to be with us for a number of years to come, un unfortunately, mm -hmm. just because emotion is uh, a very strong element to, to counter. Thank Good you. John, uh, the Internet of Things is getting a lot of attention. A lot of people, uh, 
I don't think fully understand what it, what it is, what it means, what the power, what the potential of it is. I know you're among those who believes there's a real opportunity in Indiana to, to leverage uh, IoT. You've got the IoT lab uh, that's now open and beginning to, to roll in, in Fishers. Talk about that if you could. And also, sure. just for those who might know, I know you have a, a real simple, I think a pretty simple explanation of, of IoT. Yeah. First of all, IU graduate, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just yeah. A little bit of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Excuse me. Uh, uh, yeah, so not so long ago. You could tell we yeah. were a tie, don't we? I mean, exactly. it's always Not so long ago, uh, uh, the Indiana Chamber of Commerce asked a few of us technology leaders to get together and advise them on what they thought uh, should be our public policy in Indiana related to technology, and that had great effect. We were able to you know, uh, create things like the Next Level Fund and some other things with our partners at the state. Um, and at that meeting where that was announced a little over two years ago, I got up in front of the board of the chamber and I asked them at the start of my presentation, how many of you believe that you work for a technology company? Raise your hand. Uh, and there were probably four people, you know, in the room of maybe 100 that did so. And uh, the problem with that reality is that every company is a technology company. It's just that most people in Indiana don't know that yet. Um, the F-22 Raptor, which was, is a fighter jet that was largely conceived of in the late 1970s, has 1.7 million lines of software code in it, which is a significant amount of software. Uh, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, uh, which was largely conceived of in the mid-1990s, uh, has 7.8 million lines of software code in it, a significant jump in that period of time. But the 2017 Mercedes-Benz 550 S-Class has 20 million lines of software code in it, 14 million of which are in the radio alone, okay. which makes it the uh, most sophisticated computing device that most people will interact with on a daily basis that has to power up in two seconds successfully every time when you turn the car on. Uh, it actually has more, twice as much software in it, the entire Boeing 787. That explosion of software in everyday devices, car radios, appliances, uh, production vehicles, igniters that go in your stove, and everything is creating a new oil, a new currency, a new creator of value called data. And it's not just creating it, it's already, uh, it's already occurred. The, the world's largest car rental company is Uber, and they do not own any cars. Uh, the world's largest hospitality company uh, is Airbnb, and they do not own any hotels. Uh, the world's largest retailer is Alibaba, and they do not own any stores. Uh, what do they own? They own data. Uh, Uber knows very little about you. They know that you're on a street corner and that you need to go from A to B, and they know your credit card number. And on that alone, they've been able to build a multi-billion dollar business. What if they knew more? So it's an audacious statement to make, but I will tell you this, that we are at the dawn, the beginning of a, a major shift, if not the fourth major shift in how our entire global economy is organized. The first one was agrarian, uh, organized farming, you farm, so I can buy your product in the marketplace. The second one was the industrial revolution. Uh, you go build something in a factory and I'll buy it from you. Uh, the third one, many believe, is the transportation revolution. Uh, right after World War II, we got container ships, we got ca uh, cargo ships, we got jet air transport, we got interstate highways. Really a, a revolution in how you move things. So growing things, making things, moving things. All three of those industries are super important to the Indiana economy, and they happen to be the three ones that are most being renovated live right now, early, uh, to this data-driven economy and data from all of those things. So in reality, I picked up earlier on this comment the intersection, the idea of intersecting these different industries. You all work for technology companies, uh, or you will not be working for that company in a few short years because that company won't exist. So it's not already, it's not about to happen, it already is. Mm -hmm. So Indiana has these strengths across uh, multiple sectors of the economy. We're talking about the need to uh, cross sectors to collaborate and, and do greater things. What? To start out with, what have been the barriers um, that have existed that have prevented that from happening to the extent that it should, be it academic collaboration, research, collect, all the different things that we'd like to see happen? What, why hasn't it happened to, to the extent that it has, it should, I should say, in Indiana? Anybody want to take that? What, need, what barriers need to be 
Well, I'll take a shot at it and folks uh, jump in. I think uh, first and foremost, I would say it's not like there we have not made progress. I think Indiana, from what I can tell, is among the states which has cut across company silos and the type of situation we have, the very fact that we are here talking about it, we've already made progress. So what are the things which we can do which can take us to the next step? I think it always comes down to talent. Do we truly have a culture which is inclusive? Do we talk about it at a point where we can attract the best talent from around the world to be able to do that? And I think once the world knows the secret of Indianapolis that this is truly a welcoming place, I think we'll cross that barrier. I don't think academics is an issue. We've got great universities. But attracting talent, making <laughs> this a place which people would like to come and work in, I think once we can get that point up, we are going to accelerate the progress which we already see. Yeah, John, all of you deal with that talent issue. And I think every company and community in the state is talking about it now. But John, as you look at talent, is that the, the number one issue? To, to, to I, think it's, I think it's pretty darn important. I mean, I, I think we're, speaking from my past vantage point at Lilly, I think we're way past the point where, where, it's, uh, where it's difficult to attract talent to Indiana. I think you can attract top world-class talent to Indiana. Reiner is an example of that. We also need to focus on keeping people here, right? I mean, we have tremendous talent uh, within our universities here, some of it Indiana homegrown, some of it coming from other places. How do we keep those individuals in, in Indiana? I think the other thing that, that's, that's been a bit of a, a barrier, in, in addition to sort of the natural tendency to stay in your silo, you know, how could tech and ag, you know, what do they have to do with each other? Well, we know they have a lot to do with each other, but how do you stimulate and catalyze those conversations between people that our lunchtime speaker uh, talked about? But I also think that we have to be bolder. I, I think the humility is important, but, but I think we have to show that we have the confidence uh, to be successful here, that we're proud. Uh, I think we can be proud of what we've accomplished without being blinded by it, without losing our humility. You know, they say never lead with your chin, but I, I do think we need to be more chin up uh, in terms of how we talk about ourselves and, and the credit we do or don't give ourselves to what we've accomplished. It was a couple years ago, Gary, you remember this, when I think in Indiana two years ago became the second largest medical product exporting state in the country mm -hmm. after California, not 12th or 49th, but second largest, okay? Uh, I don't have the current figures for where we stand with ag, but we're up there. I mean, it, mm -hmm. when you look at uh, output production, uh, the economic uh, impact and all that, I think we've gotta be, we've gotta stand tall and stand proud of that and let that, let that show. I mean, in the same way that people talk about being in Silicon Valley and being proud of that. And, and, and sort of letting that, that show. That will attract people here. When they, when they have a sense that they're gonna be with winners, that they're gonna be successful, that there's energy, that there's momentum, we've, we've gotta create some of that energy. I think it's happening, but we need to do more there. Yeah, Vic, uh, how about on the talent um, question uh, from your perspective? You're a global billion dollar plus company, but in a smaller area, more rural area, right. what are there different challenges that you face? Because you obviously, you, you want to get that top talent. Uh, it is, but uh, we like to turn that into an advantage uh, for us. Uh, we provide a lot of lakes uh, where we are. People have a lot of chances to live in many different uh, parts of Northern Indiana. So we're very proud to say our headquarters is in Milford, Indiana. We use that to our advantage. And I think there's nothing wrong with humility. That's part of being in the Midwest. And uh, we wear that uh, without, uh, without really talking about it that much. It's just in our daily way of uh, interacting uh, with other people. So I don't think there's anything that we need to apologize about. I, I think it's a terrific place, uh, terrific universities. Uh, in, in our, in what we have found is in trying as a company now to be able to relate to Millennium because they're a little different. I came at an age uh, where it was much different and we reacted much different and uh, we look to join a company, stay with it forever. Younger people have a different idea right now. So we as a company have to re-educate ourselves to that reality and uh, so far, uh, we're probably in the middle, not doing that well, but not doing that badly either. Uh, we can attract them, but I think John makes a good point too, and retaining them has been more difficult mm -hmm. for us to this point. Yeah. 
John, your, your take, you deal with this in, uh, a lot, in, not only with your company, but with technology uh, in general. What would you like to see happen? Are there policies? Are there yeah. things that you'd like to, to see happen with the town? Well, that, there's over a thousand unfilled uh, software coder jobs in Indianapolis. Uh, I know this because if you Google, uh, if you go on monster.com and you search for software coding, it says 1,000 plus. I don't know what the plus means. There could be 10,000, I'm sure, it's just more than 1,000. <laughs> Um, and, you know, when I went to school at Purdue, uh, computer coding was a four-year degree. Now it's more like the modern version of a plumber or an electrician. It's become a trade. And if you submit to that metaphor, you know, if we were going to treat it that way, what do we need to be able to fill those jobs? Well, we need trade schools, right? We need ways to actually train people to that objective. We need trade certifications that are sort of... Um, objective measurements of the ability of skills. If I wanted to get my hair cut today, uh, I'd have to go to someone who is licensed by the state of Indiana, but if I wanted to build a multi-billion dollar IT system, there would be no certification required, which is kind of silly, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then we also need a way to um, take students that come out of our public education system uh, at a high school level and be able to route them and give them other options into these trades that are not necessarily automatic. If you graduated high school in, say, Lagodi, Indiana, and, um, and you're not going to Purdue or IU, and <coughs> you're not going in the military, and the local mill closed a few years ago, um, to be fair, you have a fairly bleak outlook on your life, which uh, some of us in the technology business believe is actually the root kit of our opioid problem in Indiana. Uh, it's a lack of hope that people will fill with other things. But I can train you to be a software coder from Lagodi. You can do that job from your kitchen table. All it really needs is a way to train you on that and verify your skills and a high-speed internet connection to your kitchen. Um, and so in speaking with people like, you know, the leaders at Ivy Tech or whatever, uh, we tell them, you know, we could really use an Indiana Vocational Technical College right now, <laughs> right? Because the new technical vocation is coding and data analytics. Um, what if it worked this way, Gary? What if instead of the way we leave it open-ended, unless you uh, decide that you want to go to a four-year university, which is great, or you want to go to the military, which is super great, we're going to enroll you by default in a trade school education in Indiana to fill one of those roles, right? I, I said that to our governor, and I said, you know, if you could um, guarantee if, if you could guarantee me the outcome, a certified trained skill in two years, I'll do two things back. I will guarantee a, a two-year apprenticeship to complete their education process in my company, and I'll pay for their education. Because uh, right now it takes me uh, you know, $180,000 to hire a coder, but if I can hire one at $60,000 and pay them $20,000 for their education, and then guarantee that I have that person for two years. That's a two-for-one deal. I'm in, right? So we have to organize our, ourselves in the tech sector to be able to provide that clear pathway and make it an automatic. Now, we can't force people to get skill. But you know, let's, I, when I graduated from high school, I didn't know anything about anything. No one should have trusted me to make a life career decision at that point. right? I needed to be guided into university. And we need to help our students to go, uh, go the next step to fill those jobs. How does it all come back to ag biosciences and, and what we're talking about here and, and getting this cross collaboration going? Are, are there examples? Um, you know, Melissa talked about some examples out there, uh, the various initiatives, Agrinovis and TechPoint and BioCrossroads and the like, uh, 16 Tech, Indiana Biosciences Research Institute. Are there other examples we can point to that would be beneficial for the ag biosciences? I mean, at a at a at sort of a product level, uh, Gary. I was reminded before uh, coming on the panel that looking at Alanco's many of Alanco's current products, amazing number of them came from other fields. So some of them came out of human health, pharmaceutical research. One important one, our anti-flea medicine, yeah. came from uh, Dow Dupont, a spinosad molecule. Um, so I, I think right in front of us are lots of examples of, of how cross-sector collaboration has created real mm -hmm. products that would, not have, that would not have happened had it not been for this, this cross-sector uh, uh, collision. 
uh, that we that we talk about today. Anybody on 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 what's preventing more of that? Are there things that we can mm. point to now that's preventing it now from happening? Mm. Yeah, I, I would jump in on that and say this. There's a, as much as we like to sort of pat ourselves on the back about our technology industry, we still have some major issues with it, not the least of which is capital, which has been talked about before and how that needs to change. But there's a, to use an electrical term, there's an impedance mismatch between you know, the problems of companies like Lilly and, and Allison Transmission and others and the perceived ability of companies like Clear Object and other ones in the sector to be able to rise to the occasion of dealing with those problems. All the large companies have had experiences where they have sort of crushed large com small companies with their problems. And so they, you know, uh, sort of have this opinion, well, we kind of need to go to the big guys to solve the big problems. Well, um, I know it's sort of a version of buy local, right? Unless we are able to sort of uh, focus our attention on the innovative small technology companies that can really provide those engines and figure out a way uh, to work together on solving those big problems, those small technology companies will never become the big technology companies, right? And then we're going to lose them to acquisitions from out of states and other places, right? That's one of the reasons behind the IoT lab. When we were reflecting on this problem, and Fisher, the mayor, and, and John Wexler, and our friends there, you know, we, it wasn't just having a place where you could like, you know, bolt sensors to a tractor trailer, which is important. It was actually how do we collectivize a lot of these sort of interesting, niche but market-leading skills in a place where you could take a big problem and have multiple companies working on it together, right? So I think one of the things we have to overcome here, and then one of those barriers that you're asking about, Gary, is how do we sort of match the distance between these big, massive market-moving abilities that our uh, large companies have and the real innovative thought leaders that are working in teams of two or three or five at some of our small companies and really get those two things to match. Yeah. And uh, I just jump in here. I'll give you a real-life example. Like, you know, we are just in the beginning of forming a new company, Dow DuPont. Uh, we'll spare you the details, but we are on to 18 months from now, spinning into three different companies, and Ag is going to be one of them. And when we were deciding as a leadership team that what are the behaviors that we would truly want to champion, we identified four, and one of them was, we call it bring the outside in, which truly is, again, coming back to, we do not think that we are going to be the experts on everything. Uh, John just mentioned here innovation. Innovation can happen anywhere. But how do we create an ecosystem where we can truly welcome ideas which are not within our company, which come from outside, which brought my point about humility before. If we truly believe that the best ideas are all, all in-house, chances are we are not going to be listening. So this week, this week, uh, right after Thanksgiving, our R&D leadership team, which comprises of people from five different um, countries, is visiting people out, whether it's in California, Arizona, here back in Indiana, we've got people on the board with Agrinovus, et cetera, listening for ideas. But the main thing is to get the word out that we are open to doing business, partnering with people who are willing to partner with us to solve the problems which we believe we need to work on. Mm -hmm. So that mindset, that culture of bringing the outside in, once we are absolutely deliberate about it, I think that's going to help because in the short term, the reality is that we all have scorecards that we are working with. Mm -hmm. So I've got a profit objective, I've got a business objective. If you don't help me in that area, it becomes difficult to do that. So to me, we've got to get away from some of the scorecard things in the short term, have the humility to partner with outside and bring the outside in because truly if you're a magnet for innovation and you can bring ideas in, you're going to accelerate your growth way beyond what you can come up with internally yourself. Mm -hmm. okay. Building, if I may add a little bit, building on that a little bit, if you're in a traditional company like ourselves, you know, most of the products were developed from a mechanical standpoint. Then it went more electromechanical where we are now. But there's a big shift taking place in product development. Now you're going to get more in, into digit, into coding, into trying to make machines smarter. And that you cannot do it alone. You can never have enough resources in any company, no matter how large you are, to be able to do it on your own. So you have to rely on outsiders such as John's firm. And we're going to be using them after 
hearing him talk here. Yay. <laughs> uh, because we need that, we need that help. And it's, that's going to be the big shift that's taking place from electromechanical to more digital type mm -hmm. equipment. And collecting all that data is going to be another Absolutely huge challenge. True. Yep, yep. Have a, uh, a tweet a question from the audience from uh, Bitebird PS. What is the major challenge for adopting uh, IoT, the Internet of Things, to the ag field? I, I can tell you that right now. Uh, farmers are the most pragmatic people on the entire planet. Um, they um, never want to be first, but they sure as heck don't want to be last when it comes to an, a technology innovation. Um, you know, when I was a kid in uh, Fort Wayne, you know, no one was doing no-till, you know, farming, and then all of a sudden it was like everybody was doing it, right? And it was, just took one guy to basically go, I'm going to give that a try, and then suddenly like a brush fire, it becomes the common practice, right? So what we really need to, I think, bank on is some of our thought leaders in agriculture and technology, people like Kip Tom at Tom <laughs> Farms and others that are doing that, right, and say, what have you already learned that we can sort of share more broadly within the agricultural community as a best practice that is really a technology enabler? Um, it's going to come from the farmers and the ag folks themselves sharing their innovations with one another that really lights the fire across the plain. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Well, it's, uh, yeah, from our standpoint, it's a very broad subject, the Internet of Things, and how do you get your hands around it to the point where you actually develop a product from it? That is the big, the big challenge uh, that we have. We all know that it, it's coming. We know we have to adapt to it. The question is, how do you do it in the way that you come out with a product that customers will want? Mm -hmm. uh, there's no problem with farmers. I mean, they're ahead of us. And they're more than willing to use anything that's going to make them more effective and more productive. Mm -hmm. It's up to us to deliver it now. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. I believe we have a question from the audience, ma'am. Thank you so much for your comment about globalization earlier. I direct international programs at the Indy Chamber of Commerce for the nine county region, um, and we're so pleased to work with many of your companies. Uh, we're also hosting a number of trade commissioners representing um, various nations this week. And I was wondering if you could please talk about how international commerce in your fields impacts our economy mm -hmm. and how we can get more companies here working globally, especially in the current international climate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe I'll just take a stab at it uh, and then folks uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, if you think about it uh, truly, let's talk about Indiana here. If you think about agricultural output, I think we make more than what we need. So it's clearly a surplus economy. If you think about where the rest of the globe is, China and India would be the two largest producers of food in the world. But if you look at the list of countries that export, China and India don't make it to that list. The US is number one, followed by Netherlands, and Brazil is right there at the top. So how do you establish relationships at a level where regulatory, political and economical trade balances are kept in place. We have challenges in our industry where if China says no to a technology which the US farmers want to adopt, we cannot bring that to the marketplace because guess what, the output of the farmers in the US is going to be exported to China. So this is where you need to think about not only technology and economics, but even the political climate needs to be such that it is conducive to doing business globally. Uh, when there was uh, the conversation around Mexico and how we might be building a wall, there was the agriculture was the first challenge which came up. What's going to happen to agriculture laborers? Your avocados are going to get four times more expensive. Are you going to eat those? So I think we just need to be more holistic and thinking about food security globally and making sure that the economics, politics, and the financial things are lined up so that we can truly have global trade in agriculture. Anyone else on globalization? I mean, it's become a big issue. Certainly, the Indy Chamber has been very uh, involved in that, uh, among others, uh, in terms of uh, trying to connect more Indiana companies. You know, not necessarily as much the lilies and the big companies that have been doing it for a long time, but small and mid-sized companies. Um, any additional thoughts? Well, in our, in our case, uh, it is an element of our strategy and an element of our business to go global. We, uh, 
we manufacture here in the U.S. and we also manufacture quite a bit in, in Europe. Uh, and we market to about 110 countries around the world and about half of our sales comes outside of the U.S. So it's critical uh, to us. I don't, I don't see how you can avoid it. Uh, uh, you have to go where the people are. And right now, if you look where people are growing, population growth, it's not taking place in U.S. or Europe. It's taking place in the developing countries of the world, especially the Far East. And the more people you have, the more likely they have a need for food. So you have to pursue it. You cannot sit back here and, th and feel uh, happy about it. You have to start moving and trying. And at some point, you're going to fail a couple of times, but eventually you'll get the hang of it and you start succeeding. I think it's an element of thriving anymore that you have to think globally. Mm -hmm. I guess this is back to the workforce or the talent uh, piece, but in terms of uh, the understanding that, that young people or their parents have of the jobs that are out there in agriculture today, uh, or the ag biosciences, and how, as you all uh, have indicated, how technical uh, they are, and how high tech they are. Manufacturing's gone through it, you know, people think it's old, dirty, grimy factories, and they really have problems attracting young people into it. Is, is there a same, the potential for the same thing in, in, in agriculture in terms of, you know, there were some really cool tech-related jobs in agriculture, but maybe not enough people know about them. Mm. There's a great role that's being played right now by organizations like FFA and 4-H. Last time I went to a 4-H event, it was all about technology. They were doing 3D printing, and they were doing all kinds of things. So um, I think a lot of the traditionally ag-focused organizations that are working with young people already get this, right? And they're working really hard at um, making sure that even if their parents or their school guidance counselors don't get it, that the kids know that there's a great future for technology and agriculture together. And I encourage everybody to do everything they can to support that, corporately or otherwise, uh, to, to as an adjunct to the official channels of keeping everybody up to date about it. Vic, do you have challenges workforce-wise getting the kind of people you need? Yeah, to some extent, but I just want to jump on that point you're making. Uh, the, um, I think over the years, we oversold this idea of going to college and getting a four-year degree mm -hmm. uh, to the point where people now just want to work in an office. And what we, the hardest thing we have is getting in the factory, because once you're in the factory, it's the most challenging and probably most creative a, a part of anyone's uh, doing. Uh, because every day is different. So that's the challenge we have, just getting them into the, into the factory. But once it's, it, they're in there, I think they start enjoying it and they see that every day it's a different element. Mm -hmm. I just think we need to start re-educating ourselves and our people and young folks and where the, the real mm -hmm. uh, you know, creative position uh, may be. And it's not always in an office. Right. Good. I have another question from the audience, sir. Entrepreneurs um, in agribusiness or any other business, it's always important to be looking for the next Mack truck that's going to hit you broadside. Um, I want to introduce a, a subject or a topic called net neutrality. And we've had an awful lot of people here today uh, discussing technology uh, sensors of all kinds, collecting data, moving data. Uh, I come from a background in the mid-90s working for John Deere, trying to take yield data off of a yield monitor and a combine and laboriously taking it to a computer on a desktop somewhere. Um, and that was before thumb drives. And, and so it occurs to me that one of the bottlenecks, as we increase data collection and the need to analyze it, um, there's policy talk out there called net neutrality. And this uh, gentleman from Fishers, I think, Clear Objects, uh, you seem very tech-oriented to say the least. So Good. could you uh, take on that subject and how is it going to impede our progress right. and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so all you have to do is see that data is the fundamental creator or destroyer of worlds in our future. And that means that anything that's used to handle data has to be absolutely ubiquitous, uh, as free as possible. 
and certainly as even of a playing field as we can get. Um, there's sort of two things that fall out of that. Can you imagine for a minute if we allowed public uh, power utilities uh, to um, reduce the electrical power to your home from 110 volts to 80 volts if you didn't buy one of their approved fans to plug into an outlet? Like we would, like what, right? Uh, but yet that's exactly what net neutrality is talking to, right? The idea that the people that provide the pipe to your home can somehow restrict the flow of that data if they don't like what you're plugging into the other end of it, right? Um, so what did we do? Well, we created regulatory utility or utility regulatory agencies. And although I'm not a fan of any um, government intrusion in things because generally speaking, government can neither create nor destroy, it can only inhibit or uh, uh, catalyze something. In some cases, the role is proper for governments to say that's a behavior that is kind of out of bounds, and it's the same same situation we have here. Um, the other sort of implication of that is um, what I like to call rural internetification, uh, borrowing from rural electrification. If it's true that the future uh, yields will largely come from the ability to do automated farming and testing soil and deploying robotic vehicles to interject into the ground the right level of chemicals in the soil and optimize that on a sort of yard by yard basis, it means that the flow of data of what's happening in the field, not just as the thing broken down, but what is it learning as it moves across the field becomes super important. But if you're more than, say, six or seven miles outside of a major city in Indiana or uh, six or seven miles east or west of, say, I-65, you might as well be on Mars when it comes to the ability to connect that land. So we have to see uh, land that is internet connected is more valuable than land that is not. And just to quickly illustrate what I mean, if I built two apartment buildings right here, one on each side of me, that were uh, otherwise equal in every way, except that this one had high-speed internet connectivity to every apartment, and this one had none, we would say that this apartment building is far more valuable than this apartment building is, because it has that connectivity. And although the person that built that apartment building probably had to take out a bigger construction loan to be able to do that sort of connectivity, they're going to reap the benefit of having a more valuable building as a result. So we have to get our farm landowners to understand that internet connected land in the future of farming is more valuable than internet connected land that is not. How do we get them to do this? Take out, if you will, farm equity loans, right, on the value of connecting that last mile instead of the broadband industry waiting for the government to give them a handout. How about we make those uh, zero interest loans to be able to connect your land to the internet and make it more valuable? So we just got to think out of the box and just sort of have the, um, the equated metaphor in our head that internet connectivity is just like electrical connectivity was a century ago. And if you look at it through that lens, it makes things like net neutrality become very clear as to what the right policy should be and the importance of making sure that every bit of Indiana is connected to the internet, not just the people that live in a city or near a freeway. Very good. And Beth? Yeah, so I have a question from this side of the room instead of being at the podium, and it actually is probably directed towards John, and maybe Rajan can, can share a little bit as well. I'm not sure that everybody in the room understands the scope and the magnitude and the importance of forming the Indiana Biosciences Research Institute. And that, that was a heavy lift in some ways, but it took some real leadership from a core group of companies and individuals, um, our sister organization, BioCrossroads, which you all are a part of. But can you maybe share a little bit of some of the lessons learned, the heavy lift components? Because I think for us at Agronovus, we're getting people around ideas that are the leapfrog big ideas, right? Not just the catch-ups to the St. Louis's and the Kansas City's and the Des Moines of the country, but what are the, some of the things, and I think learning a little bit or just hearing a little more commentary from you all about the IBRI and the need for that and, and what was involved would be really helpful for this group to hear too. Well, Beth, it's probably more time than we've got left uh, in the program, but you know, I think that I think the IBRI was a heavy lift. It's been several years since you know, the idea was hatched, and now we have a full-time uh, CEO and scientific director. We have a place. 16 Tech is going to 
be built up around that. I think the, uh, I, I think in some ways it was an idea whose time had come. In other words, I think that with the Bio Crossroads, which has now been extant for what, 13 years or so, people in Indiana began to sort of understand better, all of us, how collectively strong we were in the life sciences. I mean, you know, we think of, of uh, Dow, du, uh, DuPont Dow, we think of, of uh, or Dow DuPont Roche, we think of Lilly here, but if you go up to northeast Indiana, you have the orthopedic center of the world up there. You have in Evansville, in, in Terre Haute, and other places in the state, other centers for the life sciences. So I think there's a timing aspect to this, but I, I really do think IBRI came down to a group of people that included leaders in state government in both the executive and legislative branches, uh, leaders at major universities, and leaders within industry here to sort of park self-interest for a period of time and say, this is something we really need to do to capitalize on strengths we already have. In other words, make the whole greater than, than the sum of the parts, uh, to build on our strengths, and to, to take advantage of these great assets we have here in the state. And remember, IBRI is not agnostic to ag. I mean, we, we didn't define IBRI as just being human medicine. It's very broad. Reiner has a lot of experience himself, I think, working with, with, uh, with Dow. So what's the next big thing for, for ag uh, uh, bioscience? I, I don't know. But I, I think the leaders here in that space, and I'm sort of peripherally connected through the Lily Alanco connection, need to really think about that and ask themselves, you know, what... What is, what should we be doing for the greater good that really makes our imprint on that space and not necessarily what copies someone else or, you know, what, what's already been done, tried and true somewhere else? Okay. You know, just to build on what John said, very selfishly speaking, when these ideas first came up internally, it enabled us to punch above our weight because there was things that we could not do just as uh, Dow AgroSciences then or Dow DuPont now. But just working with some of the powerhouses that we are talking about here enabled us to participate at a level that we independently could not have done it, even though we would be considered a big company in Indiana. So that is one. Uh, the second thing which I would say is that it, again, comes back to the whole idea of none of us is strong, as strong as all of us. Yeah. And I think that whole mindset, it is unique in Indiana. It's not possible. We have the right size, I would say, where we can still sit together, collaborate, we are not necessarily overnight competing always. Yeah, we compete for resources, talent, et cetera. But there is a common good that we can all align to. And um, when Jeff was giving his talk, he used the word purpose. I think, uh, to me, the purpose of the forums that we are talking about, whether it is Bio Crossroads, IBRI, et cetera, once we buy into the purpose, it makes it easy to contribute mm -hmm. because there is enough for us to give and there is enough for us to get back. So I think that's really what helps us move this forward better. Very good. Well, with that, how about a big round of applause for a tremendous <laughs> panel discussion? Thank you, guys. Nice, nice to meet you again. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. Thank you. And good luck. I know you've got a lot, a lot of change. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank Masterful job. Thank you. Thank you. ACDC, Run DMC, I'm just waiting for the Backstreet Boys to come next because some people in the room know they're my favorite. Um, okay, we are ready for a break. Um, Gary, thank you so much for leading that discussion and to all of you, our panelists, that was outstanding. Um, we have, uh, I'm not sure, I don't have the time, but we're gonna reconvene on schedule at 3.20. Uh, we do have outside for you uh, some Indiana, uh, snacks. Um, the Goot Wine uh, Family Popcorn Organization has provided popcorn for you. And just so you know that there's innovation and science behind popcorn. Um, popcorn was first bred to pop by indigenous Americans over 4,000 years ago. And if you've looked at your fact sheets that are on the table, you will know that Indiana is the number one popcorn producing state in the country. So uh, we are very pleased to have the Goot Wine organization represented. Ag Alumni Seed uh, sits on our Agronovus board. And so their collaboration is making the snack today possible. Get your stickers out. 
uh, spend time networking and collaborating, and we will see you all back here at 320.